Hello everyone, my name is Mr. Gentleman and we are here to do one thing and one thing only and that is discuss Ease 2. Ancient Ease Vanished. The final chapter. Note that the main analysis will mostly use the Turbo Graphics and Chronicles Plus versions of the game. Ease 2 was originally to be half of a single game that was preceded by Ease 1's content. However, at some point in development, Masaya Hashimoto and Tomoyoshi Miyazaki were forced to divide the story. With the success of Ancient Ease Vanish, they were free to continue their efforts making the final chapter. The goal of the Ease games were to make accessible, easy to pick up and understand action RPGs that were immediately fun to play. Ones that were not overly difficult, but still challenging. Plans proceeded in making a faster paced, more seamless, non-stop movement game, but as we will see, they would add quite a few mechanics to complement the already established gameplay. Because Ease 2's release and remake history is so similar to Ease 1, I will be as brief as possible. Ease 2 was released on June 24th, 1988 for the PC-88. It would become available across every Japanese PC. Most of these were identical, but the PC-98 version was visually superior. The MSX had lower resolution, but cleaner graphics, and the Famicom had a completely different style due to weaker technology. Ease Books 1 and 2 for the TurboGrafx-16 was a revolution, being faster, visually impressive, with an expanded story and more cutscenes. You carry over your levels from the first game and enemies have been rebalanced as a result. Ease Books 1 and 2, the anime, strangely enough, were only based on the first game. However, the follow-up Castle in the Sky covered the sequel. It's a pretty good anime if you're a fan of the series and enjoy the 80s style of animation. Amusingly, this game would be the inspiration for the typing game, Ease Typing Tutor. Meanwhile, in Korea, the company Mantra remade the game with their own additions to the gameplay and to the story, with some inspiration from the anime. This was known as Ease 2 Special, which I may cover separately one day. Falcom Classics 2 for the Sega Saturn began the company's attempt at evolving the original game, with an updated artistic approach and movement in eight directions. However, this evolution was not fully realized until Ease Eternal 2, where we got a new anime opening, followed by a complete overhaul with completely free movement. Introduced is the new portrait style and a largely expanded story. Enemies can now take hard swipes if you were not careful. Every NPC is now referred to by name, their dialogue is deepened, and the game even keeps a log of them making everyone feel like a person in that world. The graphics were superior to Ease Eternal 1, though it would be upgraded when both games were released together as Ease Complete. This contains the now well-known introductory movie, as well as difficulty options and the boss time attack. Ease 1 and 2 Eternal Story was the PS2's rendition of Complete where you could access an art gallery. Special weapon attributes are now applied to your equipment. The game received a DS port featuring 3D graphics. This was later repackaged with the DS release of Ease 1. Together they became known as Legacy of Ease, Books 1 and 2. Ease Chronicles 1 and 2 for the PSP removed the border so that the visuals reached the end of the screen. It added a choice between PC-88 Complete and a new soundtrack as well as a choice between Complete's art style and a new one for the portraits. This would be ported to the PC as Ease Chronicles Plus featuring a number of achievements. And finally, for mobile, Ease Chronicles 1 and 2 made their way to Android and iOS. Regardless of what version you play, the absolutely epic opening sets the tone as Adol is launched from Darm Tower and into the Land of Ease. What makes these games special isn't an elongated plot, but a strong sense of atmosphere created by music, visuals, lore, and mystery. Ease 2 had the difficult task of recreating that mood, but the game strikingly opens with our journey to a floating continent which immediately evokes the idea of a lost, ancient world and a sense of wonder. You immediately know you're entering a place filled with ages of lore. 
that it's a mysterious world apart from our own, and contains a civilization that has existed apart from the rest of humanity. The first game was a slow build discovering the pieces of Ease's mythology piece by piece, until you uncover the ancient secrets of the lost country and its fate. The sequel opens with an answer subversive for its time. That historical society never died, it simply rose into the sky. All of this carries its own questions. How did it end up there? And if the monsters are there, then where did they come from? What happened 700 years ago that made the monsters appear to begin with? And you bring with you unresolved mysteries from the first game. Who was the amnesiac Fina? Why was Rhea, the girl who looked exactly like her, in Darm Tower? Impressively, this is all the undercurrent within this single explosive moment of Adol being fired up into the sky. After the slow burn of Ease 1, this is like a combustive summation of all we have learned, while being a fast-paced, shocking start to the next part of the adventure. Taken altogether, the fantasy mystery atmosphere that permeated the first game is re-established. To me, this is one of the greatest opening cinematics ever conceived. It accomplishes so much at once, setting the tone, reintroducing the story, resolving some old questions while introducing new ones, and just overall being a great introduction. After Adol crash lands, he is discovered by a young girl named Lilia. In the remakes, she and her mother nurse him back to health. Adol soon learns that Lilia is suffering from a deadly sickness. While the opening did a great job of renewing the feeling of Ease 1, the first game had the benefit of town music that sounded mostly pleasant, but made it feel like there was an epic secret in Hysteria. But more importantly is it had the song Tears of Self. Hearing that song while talking to Sarah in a dark room created a moodiness and an undertone of a dark, sad history. First impressions are everything, and that feeling created something we carried with us throughout the entire game. Here, Yuzo Koshiro's soundtrack is glorious as usual, but the town music doesn't hold the same weight. Lilia's theme is uninteresting, and the one that plays in her house is an overly heavy, depressing one that is meant to reflect her impending death, but it's so over the top it actually ruins the mood. Fortunately, a man soon pleads with Adol to search for his brother who is trapped in the mines. And it is deep within these hollowed halls that Adol learns many truths and his adventure begins. Gameplay is as you remember it. Fast, one-to-one -one feeling movement with bumping mechanics that plow through enemies. With attack power and defense determined by stats. And with you being rewarded for hitting the enemies off-center from the side or behind and the game is designed for continuous movement making combat and dungeon exploration seamless. However, the goddesses grant you the power to use the ancient staves of the six priests, beginning with the most important, the fireball. Your long-range projectile is very powerful. Much like with movement and bumping, the game feel or keen aesthetics are what make the game so enjoyable to just play. The speed of the shot, the way it moves, and the sound effects are almost out of a shmup. It's designed to look and feel erratic with a distinct sound effect that's like a laser. It sounds razor sharp with every hit, making it feel great when it hits and gives the sensation of feeling blazing fast. The fireball pushes enemies back continuously in a single direction, complementing the seamless combat and exploration. Its travel speed is the same as your running speed, which gives the gameplay a tight and synchronized sense of pace. If a fireball makes contact, you can continue firing and build up a decent rate of fire that again feels closer to a shooter. In the end, it's visually, arly, and kinesthetically pleasing in a way that's in harmony with what Ease one established. However, I'm not fond of the recoil. You recover quickly, but it's still there and it feels out of place. The post-Eternal games contain a different system, though one suited to Ease's philosophy. The fireball is much weaker, but allows a rapid rate of fire. If the old fireball was sort of like a bullet hell, this absolutely feels like one and it's fantastic. The long-range attack gives the sensation of a rush and you just want to mash the button. Because movement is faster, the fireball needed to be recontextualized to match the new pace. The result is that everything you do still has that synchronized feeling. 
Being combined with ground movement and bumping, unlike most shooters, makes this game feel like nothing else. And now, with a lack of recoil, you can now chain the fireball with your bumping. So you can simply fire, fire while closing in, or spam while crashing into enemies. Used in conjunction, you have to coordinate Adol's movement, his trajectory, and aim. When you manage to get it right, it feels fantastic. And if you hold down the button, Adol will charge his shot Mega Man X style, making the blast more like the original game's fireball. The only thing that I feel is missing is a more visceral sound effect for both charging and firing like that game. The way MP functions is that it only drains after a few shots, though the amount before drain increases as you level up. This style is enjoyable because it allows you to be liberal with your shots and have fun with the mechanics. But it's not so much that you can simply ignore your MP consumption. Most likely due to the remakes allowing for so much firepower, a new stamina bar limits how much flame you can let off. The higher your level, the larger your stamina bar, the more you can fire sequentially. The more MP you use, the more it limits your stamina. This system overall strongly keeps the game within the realm of being an RPG. You need to level up to gain more stamina, so gaining MP is like a reward because you can rapid fire even more, making gameplay a reward unto itself as it fills your desire to feel that rush you want from using your attacks. The MP plays into the game feel, and I'd love it if more games did that. So far we've discussed four mechanics that are strongly intertwined. It continues Ease's philosophy of being simple and accessible, but since there are so many moving parts, I dare call it deceptive simplicity. Before I talk about the rest of the staves, because the fireball is so important to them, we must discuss the boss fights. Belagunder requires you to stand in front of him where he will open fire with minimal safe zones. He fires a single spread shot which you must be careful to navigate while firing. It's tense and threatening, especially since you must put yourself in harm's way and you cannot venture off too far or nothing will get done. In the remakes, he can fire a tighter shot that you must run away from. This addition makes it so that even though you understand the fight, the game makes sure you don't become too overzealous, elevating the risk and reward situation. Tylemuth leaps around and ejects ice in all directions. Mentally, you have to keep three things in mind. Dodging the icicles, where Tylemuth lands, and repositioning yourself for the next shot. It sounds simple, but it's easy to dodge and end up unable to get off a good shot. Fast movement and thinking on the fly while not being afraid of risk getting into a good position is rewarded, but again, you don't want to be too overzealous. Gelaldi will launch a giant worm creature to chase after you and only becomes vulnerable once he takes it back in. The giant skull follows you, so the game prevents you from just hanging out at the bottom of the screen since you will have no shooting position and you cannot simply hang around at the top of the screen because the worm is chasing you. You're again playing with position and risk, having to decide how long you can stay in a certain area between luring the skull and avoiding the worm, moving not just quickly but smartly, and then getting into a good shooting position. Timing also plays an important part. All of this must be considered together to take on the creature. Drugar is like a faster Belagunder. You must fire from the front while managing the energy shots. It's actually pretty forgettable. In the post-Eternal games, however, this fight is exciting as it's where Ease 2 becomes even more like a bullet hell game. You want to just fire straight into his eye, but you need to manage these eggs that release all of these beams. You need to lure him away from the bottom to make way for his vulnerable spot, but you can't sit in one place because of its flurry of attacks. There are a ton of little things to consider here, such as the recoil you get from destroying eggs. You also have to think about keeping up your stamina while shooting eggs. The game pushes you to think faster while on the move even harder. And then there is Zava. In the original games, the bird patterns are set until they go random and it gets crazy. The fast moving birds can be hard to hit at first and the fight is deliberately attempting to make you angry, getting you to just fire crazily when you need to be calm and composed. In the remakes, Zava's birds fly around featuring shmup-like attacks. Overall, this section is easier, but the surprise comes at the end when Zava herself gets in on the action. This is all about being able to charge and fire while doing some extremely tight dodging. 
Whereas E's 1's boss fights were about rushing and dodging, E's 2 was about tempting fate. You must put yourself in the line of fire and it feels like you're placing yourself in danger. But you still don't want to be too hasty as that is punished. Simultaneously, playing it safe is at first discouraged and then later is outright punished as the game finds ways to force you out of safety. Thinking while moving becomes increasingly mandatory. They all require strategizing to get in a good position while managing multiple elements. Every fight feels wonderfully busy, complex, and constantly threatening. The boss philosophy is an excellent test of the mechanics, which is the highest praise one can give. To go over the rest of the magic staves, the return staff allows for quick travel. Another allows you to see hidden items. Extremely fascinating is telepathy or transform, which allows you to become a root. In this form, you can converse with other monsters while your MP drains. This can be done to learn information as how to progress or just gain amusing flavor text. You can also use it on humans for some interesting dialogue. The game gets mileage with some moments of clever progression. Usually it's for tricking guards or speaking to fellow Rue. My favorite moment was when you used it to trick the bridge guard. Stop magic in classic versions stop time but constantly drains MP. In the post-eternal versions you can only stop time for a few seconds to get in a few hits. And the last is shield magic which we'll discuss later. The general equipment works similarly to Ease 1 with you needing a weapon, shield, and armor. And just like Ease 1, the economy is very strong. More important are the accessories. Annoyingly, in the classic versions, they're in the item menu, meaning you cannot hold both an accessory and an item at the same time. This was of course changed in the remix. The Hawk statue adds homing to your fireballs. The Spirit Cape gives health regeneration. The Claria Ring allows for an occasional free hit. The Ring of Peace gives 50% less MP consumption. The Falcon statue is hilarious. In the classic games, it practically gives your fireball a mind of its own. In the post-eternal games, your fireball turns white and as I previously mentioned, its blast splits into a huge spread shot. Ease One's leveling philosophy changed from game to game. In Chronicles, the level cap is 10, making Darm Tower more about skill than leveling. There is certainly value in that, but feels strange in a RPG. Ease 2 has had a consistent philosophy where you level up quickly but the gains are lower. Meaning the enemies get easier but they can still kill you. This allows the game to be about skill while still maintaining strong RPG sensibilities. I enjoy it when a developer manages to tweak things to gain the best possible outcome. Unlike Ease 1, Ease 2 does not have an overworld. The sequel has more of a sense of urgency and thus needs more linearity as it makes no sense for Adol to be fooling around when it's imperative he makes it to the Temple of Solomon as soon as possible. However, RPGs are known for their exploration. So how does Ease 2 compromise these ideas? The game's structure is a straight path with dungeons, but the dungeons are designed as large open-ended mazes that must be solved and thus allows for a huge amount of exploration. Since Adol logically must solve these dungeons and must scour every end in order to do so, this does not contradict the sense of urgency. Ease 2's dungeon philosophy is close to Metroid in later Zelda. If you could map out each dungeon's objectives, they're theoretically linear, but that assumes you know what you're doing. The dungeons have branching paths, there are many optional rooms, some empty, some containing an item, and some containing a blocked path of progression. Like in Metroid or Zelda, you will need items to access certain areas, but more often you're going to find the problem first. This forces you off the main path to look for said item. Mark Brown's terminology for his Zelda series calls this a large, explorable space. The design often makes everything feel more visceral. Paths are winding, looking crooked like a real maze of ridges with caves. You often loop around into another portion of the first area you couldn't access prior. All of this sells the feeling you're truly in a multi-layer, tough-to-navigate area that appears bigger and tougher than it is. Because you're constantly making choices, both right and wrong ones, you feel like you're living out an adventurer's dilemma. Making the experience feel full and substantial. Accomplishing discovery at your own pace gives you the greater sense that you are forging your own route. It's the core feeling of what it must really be like to explore and be a real adventurer, even if in real life we don't actually know what it's like to be one. Another way of saying this is that it feels non-linear for the player. I always feel an empty feeling when something feels too simple. The problem often isn't linearity, it's straightforwardness. 
When a challenge is too straightforward, there is no sense that you did anything special. Ease 2 hits the right balance for making everything feel like it has the right amount of complexity for a linear game. The fun of games like Metroid Zelda and Ease 2 is understanding the space. Understanding the way things work in them. It's understanding the area. Getting everything you manage to keep a mental note of, and finally exiting. It's rewarding knowing you mastered the space and robbed the place of everything within it. Finally, I want to pull all this together to see how progression and atmosphere create an impactful experience. Returning to what I said earlier, we are concerned with the mystery of Ease's existence in the sky and Lilia's illness. The third driving force is Fina, the mysterious girl we got to know in Ease 1 and by extension, the troubadour Rhea who looked exactly like her. The questions surrounding her stick with us, and we were told two girls were seen at the shrine, making the game a continuous build to the final revelation of who she is. Because Fina and Lilia are the two driving factors in the game, I want to analyze both of them. On one hand, we have the impressionistic Fina, and then Ease 2 has this huge blight upon it, the gaping black hole of charisma known as Lilia. Both of them only have moderate characterization, but what Fina has is design, presentation, and placement. Design-wise, she is inherently interesting. Her clothing, the specific way she is drawn, the way she is placed, and her overall look is done in a way to make her seem evocative. It's not just beauty, but a kind of beauty that gives a sense of elusiveness and even distance, making her alluring. She's first presented to us mysteriously in a cell and there being no clear reason why, surrounding her with an enigmatic quality. Her amnesia feels less like a trope and more like another layer that makes her such an enigma, suggesting a greater story behind her. The game is constantly sure to place and position her in imagery to emphasize how evocative she is. All of this leaves a strong impression of who she is and her character as someone deeply intriguing. Even in older games, it's present and they have only gotten better at it. Fina is a masterclass in how a quality anime character design can create feeling, how presentation and atmosphere can tell an entire story and speak volumes. Ease 1 was atmospheric and Fina thrived in that atmosphere. So I'm brimming with anticipation for that moment in Ease 2 where I can finally meet her again. Whereas Lilia is simply boring. I can barely analyze this because how do you analyze generic cute anime girl number 5,753,238? And because of that, any part that gives her focus is unmotivating. In fact, I'd argue she's out of place. Thankfully, you don't see much of her, even though she's present throughout the game. That said, let us move on. Ease 2 feels like an elongated climax, like a long third act, hence the final chapter. In order to save the man in the mines I mentioned early on, we begin in the ruins of Moondoria. After the lacking village music, the soundtrack reboots itself with a mix of Ease's harder and mysterious sounds. From here, we descend into the Sanctuary of Toll, where the soundtrack's conveyance of metal and stonework performed in an advanced society makes it feel like you have traveled back to the ancient kingdom of Ease. We find one of the statues of the priests, which responds to the corresponding books of Ease. Finally, we can descend into the mines, where its appearance and song communicate the feeling of something lost down here. That there is something hidden away within the dank and dark interior, concealed by time. Hidden are the sanctuaries with the rest of the statues. All of them feel like they belong in an old palace, making you wonder if the cavern once looked very different. Unlike Ease 1, this is a much faster game where we receive answers and lore about everything much more quickly. After communicating with the two goddesses through a statue of them, they ask us to go to the Shrine of Solomon to find the source of all of the monsters, making the rest of the game a mad rush to find the center of all evil. While everything I said about the dungeons applies to the mines, I agree with the sentiment that the caverns can be too confusing. The lack of visual distinction makes it hard to make a mental map. It's easy to get lost, it's hard to parse where you are in relation to where you were, it can be frustrating and confusing. Oh, and we find the ingredients necessary to cure Lilia. 
She unfortunately gets kidnapped sometime after this because she has nothing better to do. The Mad Dash begins at the ice ridge of Naltia. The music is one of the game's cooler tracks, no pun intended. I once heard someone say it could have been used in Rocky IV's training montage. I don't disagree, you're conveyed the feeling of rising to the occasion as you frantically navigate the twisting paths. Your second obstacle is the Moat of Burned Bless. The music makes you feel like you crawled into a layer deep below the earth and have discovered an evil that's trying to hold you back. The Lava Moat was made on purpose to stop the monsters, but ironically it's now ended up an obstacle. At this point I wish to compliment the game's design variety. Ease 1 mostly contained stoned wall dungeons and a cave, but now we have an onyx colored mine, icy cliffs with a blue hue, and the fiery moat with its bright yellow lava pits. These especially shine in the post-eternal games, where Naltia becomes this beautifully crafted icy cliff and Burned Bless has this naturalistic feeling as if it were within a volcano. The effect this has on the player is that it makes your journey feel big, bigger than it is, like you have traveled to an abundance of places. Like you have traveled through heaven and hell to make it to the end. It makes it feel as if you have done a lot of work and as if Adol has exhausted himself in this journey. Going from ice to fire makes it feel like there is a sense of escalation, of build-up, as you go on this journey. There is also a build in design. Naltia's Metroid-like quality is that you have to journey to the end to find the stone shoes to travel up ice ramps, which you need to get the illusion mirror back at the beginning of the dungeon. This item ends up acting as the boss key. Burned Bless is based on similar elements but involves a lot more understanding of your transformation mechanic to get key items in order to access the other, more difficult half of the dungeon. Just as a note for later, we have to rescue a boy named Tarfhair in order to let his father let us through the bridge. We arrive at Ramia Village where the song Tender People makes this place feel like we can rest. Since we'll be going between here and the Shrine of Solomon often, it's fitting. From here we can enter our destination. With some advice and support from Gorto, we head on in. Finally we make it to the temple itself where the track conveys finality as if we've now made it. But our big obstacle is the location itself. And what an obstacle it is, the temple is made up of six large rooms that you can move around in maze-like fashion. But that's not all, there is a trifecta of underground canals, a pair of wings, a bell tower, and the goddess temple. The canal even has its own music that sounds like it's telling you there is even more to this dungeon. But the crescendo gives an inspiring feeling as if encouraging you to overcome. As epic in scope as Solomon feels, it's actually far more straightforward than it looks. It's easy to feel your way through and to make a mental map of. Solomon is truly a brother to Metroid with plenty of locked areas, unlocking, backtracking, and so on across all of its areas. In terms of what later Zelda titles would do, it's even one of the earliest games to make use of changing water levels, with you having to drain the canals in order to progress. We have multiple objectives, though unlike Metroid or Zelda, many of them are tied to story elements. The people who were to be sacrificed escaped and we must contact them. But Dali's, the commander of the monsters, in a striking moment transforms Adol into a monster. So in order to access this room, we must scour the dungeon for what we need to transform ourselves back, which serves as the quote-unquote key to this room and getting here earns you the Shrine Key, giving you more access to previously inaccessible areas. Dali's transforms the people into stone, including Lilia, and we have to find a way to change them back to progress, since one of the petrified people has the key item we need to access another area. This is actually really novel, and I'd love it if more games could tie their story to the gameplay, especially within dungeons like this. An extremely memorable moment is when you climb the bell tower to stop the latest sacrifice. After the first bell, we meet Maria, the sacrifice. We rush up the steps while dramatic music plays and compelling visuals are in the background, including scrolling impressive for its time. The second bell, then third bell, and as the fourth hits, we make it to the top. There, Dallys is waiting, just to taunt you. He was actually just ringing the final bell repeatedly, meaning you never stood a chance. 
This kind of story-driven gameplay scenario, where the situation, visuals, words, and music drive us to take part, where it's very much us playing out a countdown situation was really ahead of its time. It's a moment that really builds up the inevitable fight with Dali's, even if some of the emotions are undercut when it turns out the girl is still alive later. While I do agree this is one of the greatest dungeons of all time, I also agree that it's not as exciting as Darm Tower from the first game. The coloring of the area is a lot more generic, and while the music is meaningful, it doesn't feel anywhere near as epic as Darm Tower's theme. Lastly, we deal with the final two bosses. First, we settle the score with Dali's. He teleports and summons these flames. Once again, you are tested putting yourself in danger because you must time your bumping to get through Dali's defenses to hurt him. You have more space to dodge them in the remakes, but Dali's also fires a ton of energy shots for more tight dodging. The tempting fate theme is heightened because rather than just dodging laser balls like with Drugar and Zava, you have to dodge while moving towards him since your fireballs don't work. If you try and rest, he punishes you with a volley of energy beams. Your only choice is to engage him constantly until he dies. He takes a ton of hits, almost as if the game is trying to tire you out, as if it were testing your personal stamina. Before we head into the final boss, all of the people we have met throughout the two games arrive. They all turn out to be the descendants of the priests of ease. Miyazaki wanted to portray the idea of human trust and bonding here through the forming of what is essentially an invisible party. While this is intriguing and works and has a lot of impact, I also have to say that they don't do anything of note in the end. They just sort of lend their moral support. The group receives an additional cutscene in Chronicles, but that still doesn't add much more. But most importantly, we receive the revelation we have been waiting for. That Fina and Rhea were in fact the twin goddesses of ease. Back in 1988, this kind of twist was unexpected and shocking for video games. After a final explanation of the lore behind ease, how the magic that made the ancient kingdom prosperous and the monsters both originated from the Black Pearl, you may now face the being who rules over it. The final boss is Darm, the enemy leader. You must wear the goddess ring as an accessory and you are encouraged to use the final staff, shield magic, which makes you invincible until you run out of MP, meaning that this is once again a bumping fight. Darm is a test of how well you've mastered movement over the course of two games. While I would have loved for the fireball to have played some part since we've used it the entire game, I do like that the core mechanic that we've been relying on the most is put to the ultimate test as we evade a non-stop flurry of attacks, one that can reach levels of insanity in the later remakes. Risk and reward is tested as we must measure our approach, making sure our bumping doesn't align with the incoming attack spheres. Here, Darm releases a ton of energy shots, making this a culmination of the post-eternal game's risk and reward nature. Measuring our hits to make sure they don't align with getting hit by any number of things. Timing our approach and retreat to get the maximum amount of bumps without taking hits. Like with Dali's, we must dodge while diving in, but we also have to worry about the attack spheres which approach from the outside. Darm even has a second form heightening this to the extreme with really powerful attacks built for intercepting our bumps. In the end, Darm is defeated and everyone is happy. A nice touch is that after defeating Darm, who is the master over the Black Pearl's magic, your MP bar drains to zero. Miyazaki had as a theme human nature and how what we depend on can destroy us. In the first game, people excavated Claria thinking it was silver which brought the monsters to life. In Ancient East, people depended on the Black Pearl for prosperity. But this brought about the essence that allowed Darm, who was born of magic and the monsters, to come about. Sometimes there are certain things you must give up because the cost is too great. Though I admit I would have preferred a theme closer to temperance rather than just outright banishment of these things. Something similar to Chrono Trigger. That would have felt a lot more real to life to me.
Regardless, what is here is still good, though not as nuanced as I would have liked. Fina and Adol have one last talk before she goes with Raya to seal the Black Pearl from which the monsters came forever. This involves a sleep that Fina and Raya may never wake up from. As she walks away, Adol is forced to look on, powerless to do anything. In the end, the themes have come full circle, as even Adol must give up what he wants. The later games add one thing which I love, which is our silent protagonist finally speaks one word. Fina. The ending breaks my heart every time. I know there are some people who just don't get the game, who don't understand how I can write a half-hour analysis on it. For me, it's simply all the elements, the impact everything has, the strong use of mood, the character designs, the sense of intrigue which makes everyone and everything feel more memorable and important. It all just comes together to make something that's left its mark on me. I've honestly spent all of my feelings on these two games and have explained all the elements that have made them so endearing, so special, that people play them again and again to this day. Among its fans, both East and West, these games are considered legendary. I was sure to analyze both a classic version and post-Eternal version to show how Falcom has done a fantastic job updating the game. Improving and adding more content while still adhering to Miyazaki and Tomoyoshi's original philosophy. To conclude, Ease is a combination of the best of its kind of gameplay from its time and is simultaneously a mood piece. I want my Platinum Award to be something I give out rarely, but it became more and more obvious as I did both Ease games that it simply cannot be helped. At the very least, after this I can assure you it won't be given out again for a while. I give the combined Ease 1 and 2 my Platinum Award of Excellence. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. Please consider subscribing and supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. Thank you for watching, and God bless you all.